in the no-block state, you're not allowed to call any function that could block. And if you do, you're going to, we're going to give an error message. And if, you, if we see a call to enable or unlock, we're going to go back to the clean state um, with the usual matching rules. So the system configuration you would do here is you would mark um, which root functions could block. So you'll say, look, sleep can go to sleep. Uh, malloc could block. Um, whatever variety of other functions you have um, can block as well. And then at that point, the, the compiler will, will take those call those functions and relax them up to get the transitive closure of all other potentially blocked functions. So if you say foo block and bar call foo, obviously bar can block as well. OK. So the code example here is from, again, Linux. Um, it's the Waveland driver. Uh, so here, the person calls spinlock IRT safe, which both requires lock and disables it up. And then on all the case on and then on the case on after that there's there's this copy to user call. Um, and this isn't this is a, actually a fairly serious security hole because what copy to user is going to do is copy data from the kernel out to user space. And if the user's pointer points to memory that is paged out, so it's a valid address but it's paged out, this thing is going to go to sleep. At this point, you have a deadlock, and this is actually a security hole because the user can control this whatever, whenever they want to. It's fairly easy to make data be paged out. Now, this is this rule is pretty representative um, of a of a very common thing that happens, which is that it, it's trivial to state. Um, you know, and you tell anybody they're going to get it. You don't have to worry too much about that. But if you look in a real real system, there'll be a, there'll be some set of people that know it and obey it, and there'll be a bunch of people that just have no idea whatsoever and they just violate it systematically everywhere. So in this particular function, um, if you actually, if we expanded out the ellipses here, every single case on here, there's like 20 or 30 of them, has a copy to user, copy from user type of call. So the guy has a perfect success rate at failing this, this rule just because he doesn't know. Now, the, and this is, and this is not because the person's stupid. So the, the guy who wrote this code actually was in grad school with me at MIT. Uh, he's now a tenured faculty at Berkeley, um, which is a state school, but is actually not so bad. Um, so even very smart people are surprisingly ignorant about a large system, um, especially if you come in, you just modify some piece, and then you leave. And the bad thing about how things work now is that everybody has to understand everything all the time and always obey it. And the nice thing is if you can automate this and you can suck this into a compiler, that just means one person puts the rule, sits down for an afternoon, writes a checker, and then it gets immediately imposed on all code. And this is actually a really nice dynamic in practice, um, both to find bugs and just to educate the rest of the people that, look, you're not supposed to do this thing. OK, so there's, I'll skip some of the next slides. Um, the hybrid here, things work pretty well. Um, we published a lot of papers in top conferences in a bunch of different fields. Um, these range from aggressively system specific stuff that check rules you, you could be surprised when you hear them, to security checkers, ways to do clever annotations, race conditions, deadlocks, the usual memory overflows. Um, pretty much, in general, anytime you see some rule that maps the source code, you can go after it. Um, and we've done a fair number of those. There's a bunch of sort of interesting statistical-based program analysis techniques that have come up along the way. Um, so most, most program analysis actually aim for optimization, we, where you want a zero, one decision. Can I do this optimization or not? Is it always safe or not? And often with checking, your, the types of reasoning you're doing um, are a bit more subtle and different in ways that play out in interesting ways. And I'll, I'll talk about this later Later on the talk. I'll just do it slightly vague now. Other than you, if you tweak some things, you can go a lot farther, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, I've also got tenure on this. And a lot of the stuff I've talked about so far has been commercialized at Coverity, uh, which I think now has about 70 employees and about 200 customers. So every time I have to update this number, I hope I haven't done it this time. Um, and then Shelf at the end of the talk will, can answer very detailed technical questions about what exactly um, how exactly things work at Coverity now. Uh, but I'll just straight, keep this be a straight technical talk, pretty much. I'll um, just talk about the ideas, which should work in, any, in the context of anything. OK, so the, what we know so far is the game is going to take these rules, jam them in the compiler, uh, make it aggressively system specific. And the reason we can do this is that they tend to map pretty clearly the source code constructs. They're pretty easy to digest. And it often takes just an afternoon to write a checker. You might spend longer after that refining it. But often you can do something fairly simple that actually gets really good results pretty quickly. And the really nice dynamic here is that one person can sit down and write this checker and it gets imposed on all code. 
So it's no longer the case that every browser has to understand everything all the time, uh, which is a really nasty dynamic. And the result of this is you get very precise error diagnosis. It says exactly what the error was and why. So you no longer have to be a super genius to debug machine crash back to a root cause. And it's actually pretty easy to go and fix a bunch of these. And you typically find errors in every system you look at. So I'll talk a little bit about how this plays out in the real world, um, showing a little bit about what, what the clarity system looks like for a couple of slides. And then I'll go and what sort of techniques really seem to work um, that you seem to have to add to what I've said so far. And then the rest of the talk will be um, more more closer to the research end of things, where you, you go and you try to infer what to check without having to know what truth is. And so far, we've, we've assumed that we've been told what to check for. Um, and that's, that's pretty, uh, some, sometimes pretty awkward. OK, so there's a couple questions. Um, so how well does this work with multi-coded interactions? Um, Seems to work pretty well. Um, a lot of the by multi-thread interactions, I'll assume you mean how well does it find concurrency errors? Um, so it certainly finds deadlocks very nicely. If you look for cycles and locks, so one place you acquire A and then you acquire B, and then a different place you acquire lock B and then you acquire lock A, it eats those up. Those are pretty easy to diagnose. Just then code paths, you get the dependencies, and you look for circularity. Um, in terms of race detection, it might seem that we have to do really complicated global reasoning. Um, the nice thing about race detection is that often it just evolves to fairly simple local analysis of the form. If I if I touch variable x, I better have lock l first. Um, and that, that sort of thing is pretty easy to check with the compiler. Um, the things that are complicated with race analysis is when that isn't true, when you're allowed to not use locks, or you want to have big enough critical sections, or it's not clear in the source code whether you're multi-coded context or not, which surprisingly is, is, is uh, often kind of tricky. Um, but there's a bunch of tricks that you can do to do this, um, which sort of based on the, on the last half of this talk. OK, so there are limitations in using function pointers. Um, the, tr the main weakness static analysis has, one of the weaknesses static analysis has um, is because of undecidability. If you're trying to figure out what the actual value of something is, it can be hard. If you can reason about things and figure out what the set of all possible, if you're allowed to just think about the set of all possible values of something, then it's much, much easier. Um, so if, for function pointers in large systems, they're typically, they're typically used fairly stylistically because people actually have to understand what they point to themselves. Um, so for instance, in an OS, um, there'll be function pointers for open, close, read, write, which all device drivers will map some function to. That sort of analysis is fairly simple. Um, if you do things that are in terms of C++ virtual methods, that sort of analysis is also obviously very simple. Well, fairly simple, as simple as anything with C++. Um, it, you can push it and make it harder. Um, it typically is the case that people have to understand their code to some degree, so the static analysis can also, if, if that's true for people, then the static analysis can often also, also understand it. Um, what languages are supported now? Um, so for Covarity, C++ um, Java beta product is coming out. Um, typically, you know, any language you can analyze with compiler, you can play the same games on. Yeah, I mean, the ideas aren't really tied to any particular language. Um, but they seem to work particularly well for C, um, since there's so many ways to shoot your foot off. Um, and people have been, made very big systems in C, which is also a nice time out. OK, so I'll try to race through the next section a little bit. Um, so these ideas got commercialized. Um, as an academic, I still find it kind of amusing that the company is successful enough to have a marketing department. So I'll, I'll use a 10-second proof of that uh, to demonstrate it. Um, so we had an idea. Uh, we built some stuff. People asked for it. And we built a company and sold it to, to a bunch of people. So, um, and a partial list of uh, customers. A, a good heuristic for the people who are going to buy this kind of thing is if you have monetized bugs and the, the monetization is quite high and you don't like it, um, you're going to buy if you're a company that builds applications. They don't really care if your application crashes. It probably it's a bit more dicey. So the places we've made a lot of penetration are embedded systems. You know, you, if these guys ship a box and it falls over, it's very embarrassing. So storage systems like Veritas, EMC, good. Uh, automotive is pretty good. Telco, wireless. Um, also security. Uh, so it turns out a lot of security rules are just this of the same form as I've talked, to so, talked about so far. So for instance, if I get input from the, from 